Bodies are universal. We all have one, in one shape or another. We're all anatomically recognisable as humans. At the most basic level, human bodies are living organisms which grow, develop and ultimately die. They have a limited lifespan and their health and longevity can be positively or negatively impacted by the world around them. Since Homo sapiens hunted and gathered 300,000 years ago, our physical form has evolved very little. Our physiology and our body systems continue to work in the same way. Bodies then and bodies now fundamentally do the same job. However, semantically, there is quite clearly more to the body than the 100 trillion cells of which it consists. As humans, our cognitive functions go beyond the corporeal. Our brains can communicate to ourselves and others things that the body alone cannot. Our emotions, our beliefs, our moral code. We are aware that we have both an external physical existence and an internal cerebral one. This awareness has driven our conception of what the body represents and how we view it, and it has shaped our belief in the soul. Physicality is an ever-morphing construct, and it's this changing perception which I want to explore. In the 21st century, we know an awful lot about the body. We understand nerves, circulation, genetics. We've explored the effects of illness and disease. Arguably, there's very little that we don't know about how our bodies work. There is no real mystery to it. Clearly, though, in the history of the body, these scientific advancements are only recent, and there have been thousands of years when we've not fully understood the body and its internal workings. It isn't surprising, therefore, at times when there has been a less developed scientific understanding of the body, that the physical has gained a more symbolic significance. If we think back to the Bible and to Genesis, the beginning of the human form in a Christian sense, we are told that God created man in his own image. Symbolically, then, the physical appearance of the body links us to the divine and suggests that we are innately special as we resemble the force which drives our existence. How the body works would have been a mystery, so, similarly to the creation story, a way of explaining this mystery was to position it as a work of God. In the Christian creationist sense, then, our bodies are literally made of earth and are animated by the breath, pneuma, of God. For the ancient Greeks, this incorporeal breath that animated the living organism was the soul. Having a soul meant simply living, and the adjective empsukos, which means ensouled, was the standard word for being alive. This sense was developed by Homer in the Iliad and the Odyssey, where the soul is seen to have two functions. One is that the soul is something that humans risk in battle and lose in death. The other is that the soul exists as a shade or image of a deceased person in the afterlife. What is interesting is that Homer describes the soul as something both incorporeal but also almost corporeal once it has transitioned into the afterlife. In order to explain what happens to the intangible soul after death, Homer presents it as existing as a physical echo of the real body, which lasts long after the physical body has disappeared. Perhaps reassuringly, we don't lose our souls in death, our souls become us after death. Move forwards to the early 1800s, and the American poet Walt Whitman wrote a poem entitled The Imprisoned Soul. In it he writes, At the last, tenderly, from the walls of the powerful fortressed house, from the clasp of the knitted locks, from the keep of the well-closed doors, let me be wafted. Let me glide noiselessly forth. With the key of softness, unlock the locks. With a whisper, set open the doors, O soul. Through his use of the extended metaphor of a closed and locked house, Whitman makes explicit the fundamental juxtaposition between the corporeal and the incorporeal, the body and the soul. His plea is that at the end of life, the powerful fortress house, the body, should be unlocked in order to allow the imprisoned and intangible eye, the soul, to glide noiselessly forth. So, if the soul is a separate and distinct incorporeal entity, what do we make of the body which houses it? How does it work and what does it represent? Some 400 years before Jesus and the account of the divine creation of the body, Hippocrates successfully separated the discipline of medicine from religion, arguing that disease was not a punishment inflicted by the gods, but rather the product of environmental factors and living habits. He developed the idea of the four humours, that our bodies are made up of components which must be in harmony and balance if we're to be healthy, 
a theory picked up 400 years later by Galen. The body, then, could be viewed as an accumulation of potentially warring forces which must be maintained and balanced to preserve health and life. This way of understanding the physical health of the body leads us to one of the most significant symbolic associations of the body, the body politic. Here, political structures of power and order are compared metaphorically to the human body. Like a body which can become ill or diseased or which can suffer deformities or malignancies, the body politic can also be weakened and sickened. The state is given a form which functions in the same way as the physical form and which must be treated in the same way. In Shakespeare's play Macbeth, the state of Scotland after Macbeth's ascent to the throne is described using medical terminology. Macbeth asks the doctor, If thou couldst, doctor, cast the water of my land, find her disease and purge it to a sound and pristine health, I would applaud thee to the very echo that should applaud again. Pull it off, I say. What rhubarb, syme, or what purgative drug would scour these English hens? The message here is clear. Like a real human body, the body politic should be purged and diseased parts should be removed in order to ensure that it can develop into something healthy and good. Shakespeare also develops this idea in the play Richard III by linking the body politic back to the physical deformed body of the hunchbacked king. Initially, Richard describes himself as curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world scarce half made up. It is clear that for not only Richard, but also Shakespeare and his audience, the king's deformed body is a physical external symbol of his internal moral ugliness. Indeed, this association is often reinforced in performance, with directors choosing to have Richard finally dispatched with a sword through his hunched back. His deformity is presented like a boil which needs to be lanced, not only for the good of the character, but for the good of the country. Body and soul for Richard are both twisted and deformed. There is no dichotomy between them, as they are one and the same. However, this is not a universal norm. Elizabeth I famously declared in her speech to her troops at Tilbury that while she had the body of a weak and feeble woman, she had the heart and stomach of a king. As a woman in charge of what was still a patriarchal society, she was forced to acknowledge the discrepancy between what she appeared to be and what she felt she really was. The female form has often been referred to as the weaker vessel, a legacy, no doubt, of the biblical creation story, where Eve was crafted from Adam's rib, her body merely a copy of the original, a weaker second best. Elizabeth knew that this was the common, common social perception, so sought to address it. However, rather than challenge it and suggest that women were really capable of higher intellectual functions not normally associated with the female body, she claims that her inner self, her soul, is of the same calibre as a king, a male leader. Whilst Elizabeth's words might seem to be a potent declaration of female empowerment, in reality they propagate the belief that there is an inextricable link between the female body and weakness. We may look on this attitude today with frustration, but for centuries this weakness or softness of the female physical form has been considered aesthetically appealing to men and has therefore been promoted. The female body historically has followed a code of significance set down by men. If we look at famous works of art, the pattern of representation and symbolism is clear. In the Renaissance, having a round, soft body as a woman suggested that you were wealthy and healthy. Women in Renaissance art are beautiful, have long hair, wide hips, and tend to be on the heavier side, because all of these traits were meant to indicate that the woman was fertile, and fertility was one of the most defining traits of beauty around this time. Take, for example, Raphael's painting of the Three Graces. If each woman represents a different stage of womanhood, they're all physically soft, passive, and demurely attractive. Similarly, Tintoretto's depiction of Summer shows a soft, artfully covered recumbent figure who looks away from the artist, the very picture of passivity. In contrast, Titian's Venus of Urbino is the same soft female physique, 
But instead of turning away from the artist's gaze, here the figure stares defiantly and invitingly at the viewer, not acquiring status from her weakness, but gaining power from her sexuality. Disappointingly, this reshaping of the female form doesn't last. By the 19th century, the female body is again something to be ashamed of. Now it's not simply weak like the feeble frame of Elizabeth I, and it's not simply shocking like the defiance of the Venus of Urbino. Now it's a combination of both. It's something which has dangerous, hidden potentialities, which for the sake of red-blooded men should be concealed and shaped by crinolines and corsets. The shape of Victorian women's bodies is extraordinary. Cinched waists, accentuated hips and huge rigid skirts literally and symbolically kept women in their place. With such restrictive garments, there was very little physically that could be done by women. They were forced into a physically and socially static position. Now, in the 21st century, surely things must be better. Surely the symbolism of the body has changed. Well, yes and no. Thankfully, there's now very little support for the idea that disability is an outward manifestation of an inner problem. The female body is increasingly seen as something to be liberated. We embrace body positivity, celebrate female sexuality, and we want to free the nipple. However, the female body is still thought to be weaker than the male, and when it's not, it's perceived as masculine and somehow abnormal. So, whilst our ideas about the physical are changeable and developing, manifestations of the cultures they come from, it's probably also fair to say that we will never be entirely able to shake off the early symbolic significance of bodies which still persists into the modern day. <laughs>